In this video, we're going to be learning about how thermal energy is actually transferred. I like this one when your tea is hot, but you understand thermodynamics, look, it's hot. It goes through this cold area here like this. This is actually very, very clever. This would really work quite well. You should try it. But okay, what do we talk about when we say thermal energy? What do we mean? Well, remember what thermal energy or heat actually means. This is Q. It's all about transferring thermal energy. Remember, Q is heat. Remember, that's measured in joules. So when we say that heat is going to be transferred, so thermal energy will go from one thing to another, from hot to cold, how is it doing it? There's three main ways we're going to be concerned with. Okay, There's conduction, convection, and radiation. So all these are thermal conduction, thermal convection, and thermal radiation. Thermal just means transfer of heat. So let's go and investigate further. We'll do each of the three of them here. So we'll do conduction first. It's kind of weird. So thermal conduction, how does that happen? You're going to transfer energy without any bulk movement of particles. So that means if you're like holding on to a piece of metal, you know, and you lit one end of the piece of metal and you're holding on like a, like put like a fire right near one end of the metal and you're holding on to it, it explains why your hand all of a sudden starts to get hot. Because I mean, particles didn't travel necessarily. Like, there was no bulk movement of the metal. Like metal didn't come flying at you, but somehow you got warmer anyway. And this is the process that does it. So keep in mind, first of all, the important thing is that thermal conduction is an energy transfer without any bulk movement of the particles. This is the key thing from conduction, okay? Without. So an example could be a frying pan. I was just thinking about that because I was making dinner last night. So I'm cooking it here, and I live in Indonesia right now, so where we have these, uh, we use um, natural gas I think, to heat these. So for example, I've got my uh, oven right here, or my little uh, gas burner, and I've got my frying pan. And actually the um, frying pan that we have at our house is like this. It's super stupid how it was made, but there it is. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I don't just buy a new one. I probably should. But here we go. So this, of course, this uh, the flame makes this piece right here hotter. Okay, so we have this piece of metal. Now the thing is, since the metal is is connected, what's really happening? I mean, you have to get, you know, the idea is how does my hand get hot? Well, it's because these vibrating ions are here, these vibrating molecules, they're going to transfer kinetic energy to the free electrons. So what that means is that there's going to be free electrons in this. So although, you know, they're getting warmer, so they're moving. And as they do that, of course, they're going to transfer kinetic energy to some free electrons that can float around. You know, for, for example, metal has plenty of free electrons. And those free electrons, those can, you know, go over here. And of course, because they've got energy, they can make these ones right here vibrate. And that, of course, then means that you increase the kinetic energy of these areas. Therefore, you increase the temperature. So really what ends up happening then is you end up with the, uh, the energy gets transferred sort of this way. If you get my meaning here. So that's the way that Q goes. It goes from the hotter to the colder. Now the opposite can happen if I've got in my hand a snowball, I mean I'm Canadian so of course we deal with snowballs, but depending on where you live you may not, there it's the opposite. So what happens then of course is that it's not that the, uh, you know, there's this expression you know, like, oh, you know, don't open the windows, you'll let the heat, uh, sorry, you'll let the cold in. It's like, uh-uh, you're letting the heat out. So this one right here, for example, where will the thermal energy go? Well, it's going to go from your hand and then up into the snowball right here like this. This is why the snowball is going to melt, okay? Because the, the Q right here went, in this case right here, sort of up from my warm hand to the snowball. But again, how did it do it? Well, I've got my hand right here is, you know, hot, so I've got my particles right there that are actually vibrating them, and there's kinetic energy that can be given to those free electrons. Those ones then can go in here and start vibrating this area right here, and it would make it hotter. So that's why it would go, in this case, this direction. So that's how we deal with thermal conduction. Now let's go a little bit deeper within thermal conduction. We'll talk about something called thermal conductivity. This is the key word right here we're going to need is something called thermal conductivity. So if we've got a material, and let's just look at one end of it and the other end of it, well, this material has some sort of area. And it's got a temperature, so maybe this end right here is at temperature 1, this right here is at temperature 2, this is its thickness, it's delta x, and we're going to find all these variables right here. Well, we've got an equation, and luckily it's in our data booklet, and it goes like this. So first of all, delta q over delta t. So what we're saying is the amount of heat transferred per second, okay, that's going to equal a constant, this is this thermal conductivity, times the area 
of this material right here times the change in temperature over the change in distance, in other words, thickness, right? So it goes delta Q over delta T equals Ka times delta T over delta X. This is an equation we're going to be using. So let's try to figure out what kind of units are we looking at here. So Q, uh, delta Q is the energy transferred, so that's in joules. Change in time, that must be in seconds. Okay, what about a cross-sectional area? Well, areas are in meters squared. Okay, well, we've got the temperature difference. Uh, that can be either in Kelvin or Celsius, because remember, if it's a delta T, it actually doesn't matter which scale you use, as long as you're not using Fahrenheit. Thickness of material is also in meters. So what's this thermal conductivity going to be then? I could see an exam question asking you, like, what are the units of this? And I don't think you should memorize it. You can use this to figure it out. Let me just show you. So off to the side here, I'll do this. I'll try to get K by itself. So see that? So I've got delta Q over delta T on one side. And I'll put my K on this side, okay? So I'm just getting my K here, and I'm moving everything over in my head. So i got to divide by A. All right, so I'll have it over A here. What else do I do? Oh, I'm going to divide by delta T and times by delta X. So I'll have delta X over here, and I'll have a delta T over here. So what are those units going to be? Well, it's going to be, let's see, this is going to be joules per second. So I'll just say the units then. It's going to be joules on the top, seconds on the bottom. What else? Um, oh, if since I've got an area that's in meters squared, one over that. And I've got this right here in meters, and I've got this one right here in Kelvin. So what's going to happen then? Can I figure all this out? Sure. I can cross off this meter with that one. So then I'm going to have joules per second per meter per Kelvin. Now I can go a little step further because do you remember uh, we have an equation for um, power. The power is energy over time. So if we have that right there, then every time I have a joule over seconds, okay, because that is technically two joules per second, that's actually called a watt. So I can replace this then with watts. So that means then my unit of K then is going to be watts per meter per Kelvin. So that's what I'm going to have here. So this is a more common one here. It's watts meters to the minus one, Kelvin to the minus one. Phew. So this is how we're going to deal with thermal conductivity. So depending on what's going on right here, you can solve all sorts of exam questions you know, based on this equation. But I want to point out something important is this, this, this thermal conductivity. It's a constant for a certain material, but different materials have different thermal conductivities. So for example, something has a high thermal conductivity, so K is large, that means it's easier to transfer energy. So you know, it can get hot easier. So like metals, things like, you know, iron or copper or whatever. That's like, you know, for example, my uh, frying pan I was talking about here. Uh, and by contrast, something with lower K is harder to transfer energy. So nice insulators like air is actually a good insulator. Uh, cork, lots of things like that. That's why you sometimes want to have maybe a cork or a different material right here. Sometimes I use plastic. because At least it's better than metal, at least. Because otherwise the metal will conduct the uh, thermal energy so easily, it'll go right to your hand and go out. Or sometimes what they'll do is they'll put a barrier. So sometimes, for example, if you have a metal here and a metal here, as long as you put a barrier there, so maybe you, you put some sort of insulator there, and then you can bolt the metal handle onto it, then the metal handle won't feel so hot. But if it was like one solid piece of metal there, this end right here is going to get pretty hot for your hand. So that was thermal conduction and thermal conductivity. So now thermal convection is actually the easier one, I think, to understand, because thermal convection, okay, let's look at it. Uh, thermal conduction was a transfer of energy without any bulk movement of particles. This one, it is with a bulk movement of particles. This is when particles actually move. Okay, so you start off with some particles and they actually, they move around. So something like, for example, Kermit the Frog's tea here, right? If you drink this right here, of course your throat's going to feel warm because you've actually moved particles from here and they've gone, you know, down your throat, into your mouth, whatever. Um, so. Why is that? Well, the transfer is due to uh, variations in density. So because densities are different with hot things and cold things, then things tend to move. This tends to happen more in liquids and gases, not really so much in solids. 
And let, let's, there's lots of examples you can think of for convection. And this is how you know clouds work. This is how the atmosphere works, a lot of it. So let's just say I'm in my house here. Let's say I've got my boring room here and I've got a heat pump. So some kind of you know uh, heater. So this is actually what we have in Denmark, actually where we live, where we have a house at least. Uh, there, for example, uh, with our heat pump, it actually pumps out hot air, comes out. Now, why is that helpful? We've actually mounted it uh, near the floor, which sounds weird, but it seems to work for us. And what happens is this then, this hot air then, well, when things are hot, their density decreases. That means it rises. So we say hot air rises. That's why we make hot air balloons, for example. They're not called cold air balloons. If you put hot air, it will tend to rise, and you can use that then to go up. Well, in this case right here, then the hot air will tend to rise. So it'll go sort of this way. It'll tend to make like a kind of a circle-ish. So it'll rise, sure. What'll happen then is, as it rises, because there's this lack of air then, then the colder air gets pulled. So you can sort of say that like some colder air goes this way here. So this is sort of colder, and this here is hotter. And because of that, you get this sort of current. You can get kind of a very small sort of wind almost, it feels like, you know, some kind of breeze, because you have a convection current. This happens in, uh, just on Earth, for example, if this right here is the ground and this is the water, okay, in both cases, the ground and water, and this is going to be day and night. Well, what's happening, of course, during the day, because the sun is, you know, shining on the ground, let's say, and the ground is hot, well, then because of that, the land is hotter, so it's going to rise because its density decreases. Now, of course, what's going to happen, it's going to be pulling some colder water then down, uh, sorry, colder air. So the colder air is going to be like this, it's going to make this convection current. What happens then is you get a sea breeze so on the ground. That's why during the day, the wind tends to come sort of this way. So if you're standing here, you're going to get sort of the wind in your face, you know, at least because of this. Now, of course, there could be other factors at play, but at least just because of this temperature differential here, um, so this density differential, sorry, then this one here is going to create these sea breezes. And by contrast, the opposite happens as well. So this one right here at nighttime, then what happens is, uh, well, the ground is actually cooler, the air, uh, the water is actually hotter. So what happens then? Well, then you end up with um, the opposite happening here, right? So you're going to have the um, hot air is going to go like this and then the cooler air then is gonna go like this. So what happens then is you end up with a breeze going that way, so hooray. So that's thermal convection. So last but not least is thermal radiation. That's another way that energy can be transferred. Now this is the transfer of energy by electromagnetic radiation. What do we mean by that? We just mean light. So this is when light basically causes you know, temperature changes. Now, how can that happen? I mean, you've got some light. We're going to draw like some photons, you know, coming in and hitting something right here. The beautiful part about it is it doesn't need a material in which to travel. So where, uh, I think I just made it worse here. So light is, is nice. It doesn't need a material. So convection and conduction, it needs a material to travel through. But uh, light doesn't. It can actually just go right through a vacuum, which is kind of nice. So uh, we're going to go a lot deeper into this with black body radiation when we learn about those things. We're going to be learning about, for example, um, the apparent brightness of something is related to its luminosity, so 4 pi d squared. We're going to have an equation for luminosity. It's going to be sigma times at to the fourth. We're going to be doing lots more with these things, but don't worry about it. That's in another topic. But I just want to explain one thing that's important is that light itself, you might think like how it is that light can actually um, do this. You know, how is, I mean, you, you know this, if it's sunny, let's say you're in a room and the light uh, from the sun is shining in that room, of course that room's going to get warmer. Now, different properties of light happen with different wavelengths. So it's, it's kind of cool. Even if you have light shining on you, different colors of light do different things. For example, ultraviolet light, on my skin at least, it gives, you know, it makes me get a sunburn. So that's one thing that that type of light does. Infrared, for example, uh, that can do something different. That's sort of heat. That sort of tends to be, that's why we radiate in infrared. Uh, that's why you can use night vision goggles to see humans, because we actually radiate light. It doesn't look like it, but we are shining light just in this specific wavelength called infrared. So it's redder than red. So larger than like what, seven or 800 uh, nanometers. But for example, microwave, that's an interesting one. So if the wavelength is between 30 centimeters and about a millimeter, it has a special property, that type of light, that color of light, even though we can't see it, that light has a tendency to vibrate water molecules, for example. 
That's why we have a microwave oven. You slap something in there that hopefully has plenty of water in it, and what happens? That particular color of light will transfer kinetic energy uh, in the form of heat. So that, that those those um, particles of light called photons, they will actually excite these water molecules, molecules, and because they get excited and they move, then they get kinetic energy, that goes to heat. That's why your microwave heats things up. Hooray! So what have we seen? We've seen that there's three main types of thermal energy transfer. We've seen conduction, right? That's where there's uh, without bulk movement of particles, convection where there is bulk movement, and radiation when it's just coming from light.